In this video, we're looking at the second part of the quantum topic, excitation and energy levels. It's important at this point to separate this part of the topic from the previous. Photoelectric effect was an observation carried out long before the idea of energy levels came about. So they're not very compatible. And in fact, it can lead to confusion in mixing up the two concepts. So where previously we dealt with a charged surface having excess electrons removed, now we're talking about manipulation of electrons in normal atoms. So if an electron in an atom gains enough energy, it can leave and it can become an ion. Now, the atom that's become an ion will have excess of positive or negative charge, but we're only looking at the ones that lose electrons. So when enough energy is provided, they can fully escape. But in this case, we're actually looking at situations where ionization does not occur. But instead, the photons that have gone into the atom and been absorbed by the electrons are causing something else to occur. So it's important to remember that ionization can occur by absorbing photons and by collisions with other particles. Now the same is true for this concept, excitation. So if an electron or another particle were to come in and collide with an atom, or if adequately energized photons were to enter and be absorbed, it's possible for an electron in an inner shell to take that energy and jump to another shell further from the nucleus. Now this is called excitation, where the atom itself and the electron that's moved are now considered to be excited. Now this only occurs when an exact amount of energy is provided, a discrete value that represents the difference between the position of the two levels. So these shells are going to be referred to now as energy levels. Now if a photon did not have enough energy to provide this jump, it simply wouldn't interact with the electron, which is a very bizarre scenario to wrap your head around. So we're talking about electrons in an atom in their ground state. That is their normal natural position to be in, the most stable energy level. And when it becomes excited, the electron will jump to one of the higher energy levels. Now, these energy levels are specific and unique. So every atom, every different element, will have a set range of energy levels. And the total combination of those energy levels will be unique. Now, when we look at energy levels, we usually use an energy level diagram. Now, these diagrams may look confusing at first, but they're actually quite straightforward when you realize what the negative values mean. So the bottom level is the ground state, and that's where your electrons are normally going to be. So we label that n equals 1. Now that has a negative value, minus 13.59 electron volts. That is the amount of energy needed for the electron in the ground state to leave the atom, for it to become an ion as the electron has left. So n equals infinity is the ionization energy level. And as you can see, the energy value is zero because that's how much energy would be needed at that level to escape.
So this is essentially an energy well. So the electron is trapped at the bottom and needs to climb up. Now, it's not possible for an electron to absorb more than one photon or to hold energy from multiple interactions. It can simply make the jump to a higher energy level if adequate energy is provided. So for example, to make the jump from ground state n equals 1 to n equals 2, you need the difference between the two energy levels, which gives us 10.19 eV. Any tiny amount more or tiny amount less would not be the correct value, and the photon providing the energy simply wouldn't interact with the electron. Now, we know that the electron can only go up as the energy demands, but once it's there, it can't go up any further. So it's temporarily stuck. And the only way it can go is down. So an electron that has excited will eventually fall back to the ground state, de-excite. Now, as it does so, it would be losing energy. Because it's going from one level to another, both have different energy requirements, so it has to release that energy as a photon. Now, that photon will have an energy that is the difference between these two levels. But, whilst the electron drops, it is actually possible for it temporarily to stop at another energy level way down. So in this case, not only can the electron fall from n equals 3 all the way down to n equals 1, but it could stop off at n equals 2 which would mean two drops, which means two different photons being emitted. So you can see here, the electron dropping from n equals 3 could result in one of two situations. One gives you one photon, the other path releases two completely different photons. So this process of de-excitation depends on the level you're starting from. The energy that's absorbed by the electron must be released, and it's released as photons pending the path taken. Now there is an equation given for this, and that is E1 minus E2 equals HF. Now this is pretty obvious when you consider it. H know is Planck's constant, and f, we know, is frequency. And together, they represent e, the energy of the photon. So when we have e1 and e2, we're simply talking about the energy at that level. So when we're taking away e1 and e2, all we're finding is the energy difference between the two levels. So this could be excitation or de-excitation. This energy difference simply relates to the photon being absorbed or the photon being emitted, usually the latter. So this is just another variable of our basic equation E equals HF. So whilst making the different pathways down, we know that the energy difference between these levels will result in different energy photons. But we know that energy is proportional to frequency. So each of these photons, based on the different gaps, will be of a different frequency, a different wavelength. So you will get a range of specific frequencies due to the specific energies of the photons. 
this is particularly useful. So if we have white light being emitted from a source through what's called a diffraction grating, which we'll cover in the waves topic, you can spread the light and end up with a continuous spectrum, your full rainbow. Now if instead you have a specific gas, let's say hydrogen, and pass that through the diffraction grating, you will get specific lines of light. Now this is called an emission spectrum, and this is due to the fact that the hot gas has a lot of energy, and therefore the atoms are excited. And as they're continuously de-exciting, they will be releasing photons based on the energy levels present in those atoms. Now, as we said, that's unique to the element. So that gives us a specific range of frequencies to observe. A fingerprint, for lack of a better term. Now, similar things can be done with a cold gas. If trying to identify what a gas might be without exciting it, potentially being explosive, you can shine white light through it. And as you do, the atoms will absorb and become excited by those waves, blocking them passing through. Now there's one specific example you're expected to know for the energy level topic, and this is a practical example to do with fluorescent tubes. Thankfully, this is a very simple process that is simply repetition, demonstrating what you've learned so far. So we start off with current. There's an electrical current passed through this tube. Now the tube contains a mercury vapor, so gas state mercury. Now as the electrons in that current flow from one end to the other, they are inevitably gonna collide with some of these mercury atoms. And that collision makes them excited. So excitation has occurred. Following this, de-excitation is the inevitable next step. So the mercury atoms will now de-excite. Now as they do so, they've been specifically chosen so that they will emit UV photons. So at least one of their gaps in energy levels provides the appropriate energy and frequency for UV. Now UV is useless to us, we're not using that for our light bulbs, for our fluorescent tubes. So what can we do with it? Well, in these tubes, the coating is made of phosphorus. So those UV photons will then move to the outer edges and be absorbed by the phosphorus atoms in the coating. Now those Phosphorus atoms have now become excited, so we have our second excitation happening in this process. This time, however, as it de excites, we will end up with one of the gaps providing visible light. So, as the phosphor atoms de excite, they will emit visible light. And that will be our final point. So this process simply shows us excitation by collision, de-excitation to release UV, which is not the useful output, absorption of photons to cause excitation, and then de-excitation, where one of the gaps will provide visible light. So showing both processes of excitation and de-excitation of different types of radiation allows us to really make use of this as a full understanding of the topic. And it's a very common choice for either an extended answer question or multiple two to three mark questions that carry the overall narrative. And that's it, really. If 
hope you know that you know the topic. Thank you for your time.